Can someone say amen? This is your message title. Are you ready for it? If you're ready for it, say amen. The message title this morning is a question. It's a question. And here it is. I want you to ask this with me. Will God move? Ask that, ask that with me. Just look at someone and ask them, will God move? Amen. If you're at home there, look at your neighbor and ask them, will God move? I believe it's a question that many people have been asking lately. Amen. Look at 2 Kings chapter 7. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The scripture says that Elisha replied, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver. And 12 quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your very own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. Verse 3 says, now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here Waiting to die, they asked each other. Why should we sit here waiting to die? We will starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. And if they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and galloping horses and the sounds of a great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and they ran into the night abandoning their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and everything else as they fled for their lives. When the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into the one tent after another, eating and drinking wine, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right, this is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait till the morning, some calamity will fall upon us. So come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. Verse 10 says, so they went back to the city and they told the gatekeepers what had happened. We went out to the Aramean camp, they said, and no one was there. The horses and the donkeys were tethered and the tents were all in order. But there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the news to the people in the palace. I want you to look back at verse number three one more time. It reads, there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. And they said, why should we sit here waiting to die? Why should we sit here waiting to die? I want you to look at the person sitting next to you and ask them again, will God move? Amen. Look at someone there in your living room or at work or next to you and ask them, will God move? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. Father, I thank you that for in your word we find sustenance. We find our daily bread. We find life. Father, and I thank you for speaking to us out of this word. A rhema. A right now, an on time word. Father, we know that you are still speaking. You are still ordering from heaven. You still have an agenda. And Father, we ask that your will be done. Speak to us today. Father, convict us today. Challenge us today. Move us today. Move us forward in purpose. Move us forward in destiny. And most importantly, move us forward according to your will. We surrender to you. Father, I move out of the way. I ask your spirit to say what you would desire. And only that, articulate what you would desire 
in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. Can y'all give God a great big shout of praise again one more time? Can you do the same online? Amen. Look at your neighbor again and ask them, will God move? And I'm good, guys, and you guys can go ahead and have your seat. Uh, just ask them two more times. Ask them, will God move? And then turn around and ask someone else, will God move? This is uh, a question, I believe, that is at the heart of the body of Christ right now. And I believe it is because we feel the need for God to intervene. How many of you feel that God needs to intervene in the world that we live in right now? Don't be ashamed. Amen. I'll lift both my hands. I'd lift both my feet if I could, but I can only get these two hands up right now. We need God to intervene. We need him to intervene in this nation. Can somebody say amen? We need God to intervene in this world. Can someone say amen? We need God to intervene in our lives and in our homes. We need a move from God. If you're there at your house and you are convicted about this, will you lift up a shout of praise and just and tell someone we need a move from God? I'm having a little dental problem right now. Y'all going to have to excuse me. Um, this is the question at the heart of the body of Christ right now. Is God going to move? Is he going to intervene? You know, time and time again throughout the history of the people of God, you see moments in time that arrive where the people of God ask this question. You see the people of God get to a point where they ask over and over again, will God do what we heard about him doing in yesteryear? How many times in scripture do we see the people of God crying out for God to do what he used to do? How many times in scripture do we see the people of God even get to a point where they say God is never going to do what we heard about him doing with our forefathers. How many of you know that we live in an hour like that right now? People are beginning to question, is God ever going to move the way that he used to move? People are beginning to question, is God really real? How many of you know people are beginning to question that again? People are beginning to wonder, is God really ever going to intervene with what is going on? This is a critical hour that we live in. Look at your neighbor and tell them this is a critical hour. Amen. Uh, my dad used to always say this, and I'll get here in a minute. This is new to me to preach to y'all and preach to that camera. But my dad used to always say this, that a desperate hour calls for a desperate people. I'm going to say it again. A desperate hour calls for a desperate people people. We see the woman with the issue of blood. She was desperate. And we see that her desperation causes her to act different in relation to everyone else that was around her. As a matter of fact, she acted so differently that it garnered a different response from Jesus. When Jesus turned around and asked, who touched me? Yet everyone had been touching him. Why was hers so impactful to him? It's because her touch was a move that was done out of desperation. There is something about actions. There is something about life. There is something about decisions as it pertains to our walk with God. That, that, that matter, that, that, that our attitude and the mode and the spirit in which we make those moves and decisions in, they matter towards how God responds to us. Did that go over your head or, or, or did, did you stay with that? Can someone say amen? And so here's what I want you to know. There's a principle. There's a truth here. That there is a relationship between a season and the obligation that the believer has to that season. Let me say that again. There is a relationship between a season and the obligation that the believer has to that season. In John chapter number 4, Jesus says in John 4 verse 34 that my food is to do the will of him 
who sent me and to finish his work. He says, don't you have a saying, it's four months until I harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. In verse 38, he says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. In other words, your obligation to your season is not what your predecessor's obligation was to their season. There's an obligation that you have to your faith simply because you were born into the kingdom for such a time as this. Can I get an Esther to say something to me in the building? Can I get somebody that is walking with the spirit of Christ in their life to attest and to witness what I'm preaching? Jesus realized that he was sent to his time, that he was made for that moment, that 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 moment was made for him, that that season demanded and placed an obligation on him. Is there any believers online or in this house that realize there is something about this hour that obligates me to act a little bit different than everybody else that came before me acted? I know my praise might be a little more crazy than my mama's was. I know my faith might be a little bit more intense, but I I understand the hour in which I was born. If you know that you were made for this moment, can you lift up a shout of praise in this place? I can't hear myself. I need monitor. Can y'all lift up some monitor in here, Josh, so I can hear me? I need to hear myself. I'm about to lose my voice. Amen. Come on here. Testing, testing. There it is. Now the monitor's on. Amen. Come on, keep lifting it up. Give it to me. Now, y'all, I need, I need some monitor. I'm going to kill myself here. Amen. Okay, y'all go ahead and sit back down. Last couple of weeks, the last couple of weeks, we preached a message, how woke are you? Look at your neighbor and ask them, how woke are you? And then last week, we, we preached this message. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> when you look at your neighbor and ask them, may I have your attention, please? Or pull out your little selfie camera and look at yourself and say, may I have your attention, please? <laughs> what are we learning? We are learning that assignments require awareness. Say it with me. Assignments require awareness. And we must be aware that heaven's agenda is responsive to earth's activity. We walked through this from Genesis chapter number 3 to Genesis 6 to Genesis 9 to 1 Kings chapter number 17. We see that the activity of earth will cause heaven to respond with its agenda. And heaven always most certainly has an agenda. I just want to remind you of a few things. The ultimate agenda is found here in Ephesians chapter number 1. In verse number 8, with all wisdom and understanding, the apostle Paul writes, he made known to us the mystery of his will. In other words, the apostle Paul says that God has always had an agenda, but for a time being, it was a mystery. It was impossible to know what that complete agenda was. But he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. What times is he talking about? He's talking about this time. Look at someone and tell him this time. He's talking about times that have passed. Look at someone and tell them times that have passed. He's talking about times that have yet to come. Look at someone and tell them, times that have yet to come. And so when all of these times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. What is this? This is a reflection 
of his original intention that we see all the way at the beginning in Genesis chapter number one, number two, and some into Genesis chapter number three. We see that there is a desired relationship that God has according to his will for there to be a relationship between heaven's agenda and the activity of earth. He wants heaven and earth to be in sync. Can someone say amen? God doesn't want to just get you to heaven. God desires to get as much heaven to you here on earth as he possibly can. Can someone say amen? The apostle Paul talks of how we taste, we experience moments like this. It's what makes us frustrated sometimes. Because there are seasons in our life that we're walking according to the Spirit of God. And you know that you are so in tune and in sync and in step with what heaven is saying. You feel like you can't miss. And then you wake up another week and you realize, man, I've gotten all out of whack. It's the frustration of a believer. But the Apostle Paul encourages us to press on, to keep moving forward. Because heaven has an agenda not only for this earth, but he has an agenda for you. He has an agenda that is coming through you. Can somebody say amen? And so we've got to be aware. We've got to be aware. Now we have to be aware now that it is a prophetic hour. It is a prophetic season. Can someone say amen? In January, we prophesied that it is open season. Do y'all remember that? Look at someone and say, it's open season. <laughs> it's very akin to 1 Kings chapter number 17. Because we see, and you don't have to turn there, but you can note it. In 1 Kings 17, that Ahab the king had arrived. And he had been doing what everybody else did before him. Except he took things to another level. Y'all remember we talked about that. And he took it to such a level that he made everything that everyone before him did look like child's play. That's how the Bible describes it. And it, it got a reaction from heaven. What was that reaction? That reaction was an assignment. Everyone say an assignment. That reaction was an assignment that was the man and the prophet named Elijah. And so we see that God most certainly responded to Ahab because suddenly in 1 Kings 17, Elijah, the Tishbite, just shows up. And he says that the heavens are going to be shut up. It's not going to rain until it, I say so. It's not going to rain except at the sound of my words. And so we see for the first time that the prophet Elijah shows up in scripture. Why is that important to us today? Well, first of all, we have to understand that prophetic things happen during an open season. Prophetic things happen during a prophetic season. See, Jesus likened his own arrival to that of Elijah and Elisha. In Luke chapter number 4, in verse number 22... The scripture says that everyone spoke well of him, and they were amazed by his gracious words that came from his mouth. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? And then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time. Yet when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was instead sent to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman. A Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. They jumped up, they mobbed him, and they forced him 
to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. And they had intended to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and he went on his way. Jesus showed up and he said, my showing up is the same as the spirit of the prophet Elijah and the spirit of the prophet Elisha. We see him confirm this again when he speaks of his cousin, John the Baptist. Why is this important to us, Pastor Dustin? Because Micah chapter number four tells us that in those days, in those last days, that I'm going to send the spirit of the prophet Elijah and I'm going to turn the hearts of the children to their father and the hearts of the fathers to their children. I want you to know, church, I want you to know, place for life that we live in an hour when I believe that God is certainly pouring out the spirit of Elijah. It is a prophetic season because the activity of this earth has demanded that heaven open and respond in the way that it is responding. Look at someone and tell them it's open season. It is prophetic se It's prophetic season. And so we have to understand that prophetic things happen during a prophetic season. Jesus stated this, that in essence, his assignment was limited in a region of familiarity. Okay, we're going to get somewhere here today. So Jesus was acknowledging that the spirit of familiarity can be fatal to prophetic power. Oh, Lord, help me in this place. He acknowledges that the spirit of familiarity can be fatal to prophetic power. In other words, you can limit yourself to what the prophetic can do in and through you if you carry a familiar spirit within you. Can someone say amen? What is a familiar spirit? Well, we know that familiarity is when you know something so well that awareness on your part is no longer felt to be necessary or vital. I'm going to say that again. Can I say that one more time? What is familiarity, Pastor D? Familiarity is when you know something or you think you know something so well that awareness on your part or on my part is no longer vital or necessary. Now, don't put all these notes up, Ronnie, because some of this is just my thoughts. So let me ask this, and I've been guilty of this probably yesterday. <laughs> How many of you have ever driven to your house and pulled up in your driveway and then thought to yourself, wait a minute. How in the world did I just get here? <laughs> you were driving in a spirit of, <laughs> in a mode of familiarity. You know why? Because you're familiar with the drive. You know the drive so well that you don't even think that I need to look up and pay 100% attention to the road. I'm just going to give it my left eye or about half my left eye and, and give my radio my right eye. Or some of us, like me, what I do is I daydream. I start wandering off in my head. And I realize that I got home and, man, I didn't even think about any of them turns that I made. I didn't even think about what I was just doing. I wasn't paying attention. Why? Because I'm familiar with the drive. Oh, you, I realized that I wasn't paying attention. You know, some of us think that we know God so perfectly well. Oh, some of us think that we know him so well. Some of us think that we know everything that he likes, everything he doesn't like, everything he's going to do, everything that he already did. Some of us think that we know God so perfectly well that we are operating in a familiar spirit with him and we don't even know it. How many of you are really paying attention? How many of you are really being aware that he is God? There is always something about him that I've got to learn. There's always something about him that is yet to be discovered. There is always something about God that I am striving to understand and make sense of. God is bigger. He is beyond what I could ever imagine. There is never a day in my life that I ought to arrive to that I say I know everything about him and what he wants from me as a matter of fact I bind the spirit of familiarity out of this building up out of every home and I speak a birthing of a fire a new hunger deep down in your soul and in your heart I 
pray that there is something birthed in you that says, God, I want to know more about you. Can somebody give God praise in this place? Familiarity is when you know something so well that awareness is no longer vital or necessary. Assignments require attention. This is a dangerous place, familiarity, because assignments require attention. Look at someone and ask them, may I have your attention, please? Can I read Ephesians 5 again? To you, we were there last week, but the Apostle Paul says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Everyone say carefully. Take no part. In the worthless deeds of evil and darkness, instead expose them. It is shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake. Look at someone and ask them, how woke are you? Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Be careful how you live. 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 Be careful how the, I mean, you live. Be careful how your, 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 I mean, you live. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Look at someone and tell them, be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise. Be careful how you live. Why? Because that's how wise people live. Wise people are concerned about themselves before they're concerned about everybody else. Fools are concerned about the world around them before they are concerned about themselves. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. I fear that there are too many missed opportunities in purpose because too many are not paying attention to the person. Let me say it again. There are too many Missed opportunities in purpose because too many are not paying attention to the per person. There are too many missed opportunities in purpose because of foolishness. Let me make this statement. Familiarity is a product of foolishness. Mm. Familiarity is a product of foolishness. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, be careful how you live, means circumspectly. It means exactly. It means accurately. It means diligently. You know what happens when we are not being exact? You know what happens when we are not being accurate? You know what happens when we are not being diligent? A familiar, a familiar spirit sets in with us. These words, circumspectly in the Greek, is akin, it's from a root word that means to go to the extreme. Mm -mm -mm. Look at your neighbor and ask them this question, how extreme are you? Now, I'm not talking about will you jump off a cliff into a lake. <laughs> I'm not talking about will you skydive out an airplane. I'm not talking about will you go 100 miles an hour down the interstate on a motorcycle with no helmet. I'm not talking about those kind of extremes. I'm talking about how extreme are you with your walk. How extreme are you with yourself? Do you have that same prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139? Search me, O Lord. See if there be anything in me. Search the furthest parts of me. Father, I want to be submitted to your will. Father, search me until it makes me uncomfortable. Can somebody say amen? How extreme are you? How many of us truly pay attention are you most extreme with yourself? You see, Jesus discussed the nature and the essence of the kingdom of God as being extreme. In Matthew chapter number 11, Jesus says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven 
has been forcefully advancing. And the violent take it by force. Y'all in the building this morning, place for life. Amen. Can y'all shout something at me? Y'all falling asleep on me this morning. Amen. You're going to come to church in here, then get up in here, shout me down. Can somebody say amen? Or stay at home and drink some coffee and watch on the computer. Amen. <laughs> From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and the violent take it by force. The best way to explain this, I found a commentary that explained that the Greek renders it that the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. It's like the kingdom of heaven is carried away by an intense storm. That to share in the kingdom of heaven, that to share in the heavenly kingdom is sought for with the most ardent zeal and the intensest exertion. Can I read that again? That to share in the heavenly kingdom is sought for with the most ardent zeal and the intensest exertion. In other words, you cannot understand or partake in the kingdom if there is nothing about you that is willing to go to the extreme with yourself. Can somebody say amen? I wrote this down this morning, and I want to remind you and give this to you, that the kingdom of heaven does not manifest through complacency. Oh, Lord, help us in this building. Uh, shake us up in this building today. Father, wake us up in this building. Complacency is an enemy to the kingdom of God. Complacency is an enemy to the kingdom of God. Why? Because complacency is an enemy to progress. Complacency is an enemy to advancing. Complacency is an enemy to growth. Complacency is an enemy to the kingdom of God. Look at your neighbor and ask them, will God move? We get in there. What is complacency? It's a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or with one's achievements. Let me read that again. What is complacency? It is a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. The Bible talks about people like this. The Bible talks about people that can't handle critique. I won't give you a name. Just go and read it tomorrow morning in the book of Proverbs. You'll find it in there. Ask yourself this. When should I be careful? When should I be paying attention? When should I be doing what the apostle Paul talked about in the, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter number 5. When should I be paying close attention to the way that I walk? When should I be being very careful about the way that I live? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, in verse number 12, the apostle Paul answers this for us. He says, therefore, let him who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Oh, Lord, open our ears in this building this morning. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, the complacent person is the one that is least likely to make any progress at all. The complacent person is the one that is not fit for the kingdom of God. You have to ask yourself this morning, am I complacent in this hour? Because if I am complacent in this hour, then I am not walking in my God-given obligation to the season that he has placed me in in this earth can I get you to say amen and wake up and some of you need to just show forth that you are complacent if you are not complacent can you just show God and show all of heaven there is nothing complacent about me to be complacent is to be unconcerned to be complacent is to be unconcerned it's like the man that James talks about that reads the word and then walks away and forgets, it, it, like a man looking in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. To be unconcerned, to be complacent, is like hearing the word. It's like reading the word. 
in not allowing it to phase you or move you. I'm not concerned about that. That doesn't worry me. That doesn't pertain to me. I'm not obligated to anything unique or special. Everyone say complacent. God detests complacency. In Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 16, he says, Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. The only way to break out of complacency is to become unsatisfied with yourself. I'm not talking being disgusted. Don't get it twisted. You've got to arrive at a place in your life where you realize I have not arrived at all. There is still more out there for me to do. There is still more purpose out there for me to live. There is still more witness out there for me to live out. There is still more growth in my spirit to happen. Can I get somebody in this house to wake up and say, God, shake me out of my complacency. Father, make me a better man than I was yesterday. Father, Father, make me a better woman than I was yesterday. Can somebody give God a praise in this place? You've got to say, God, there's more. Isn't this the spirit in which Paul was writing in Philippians chapter number 3? When he says, I once thought these things were valuable. Verse number 7. But now I consider them worthless. My priorities have changed. My value system has changed. I have learned to become unsatisfied, yet content. Why would a content man write? In verse number 12 of Philippians 3, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on. Can I ask you a question? Are you pressing on today? He says, but I press on. Look at someone and tell him, I'm pressing on. What is he talking about? I'm pressing on to possess something. To possess that perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. No, my dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I am not complacent. I am not satisfied. I have not arrived. He says, but I focus on this one thing. I forget the past. And I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. I'm praying that you shake up out of your complacency today. There's always room to press. Look at your neighbor and tell him there's always room to press. Lord, it's hot in this building. I'm sweating. I bet I'm all shiny on the computer right now. <laughs> Jesus gives us, I'm almost finished. Look at someone and ask them, will God move? We're going to get there. Mark chapter number 10, Jesus gives us an example of shaking out of complacency. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up. To him knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus said, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you must know the commandments. You must not murder, commit adultery, steal, testify falsely, can't cheat, honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Familiarity. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him familiarity. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. Is this a commandment? No. Is this a law? No. Then what is Jesus doing? Jesus is addressing this man on a personal level. Jesus is saying you have become so familiar 
that you think there's no more room to grow. You become so familiar, you won't even allow me to get you uncomfortable in your current state of complacency. I want to shake you up and shake you down right now. That's what Jesus told this man. Go sell everything you have. Give all the money to the poor. And then you can have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Then you can participate in the kingdom. At this, the man fell at his face. And he went away. For he had many possessions. He was a rich man. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich? Let me change this vocabulary. How hard is it for the complacent? Because you can act as complacent as anyone and have a negative $50,000 bank account and still think that there is nothing more you need to learn about him and there is no more work that he needs to do on you. It is impossible to inherit and walk in the kingdom of God. God in the spirit and the attitude of complacency. It is an impossibility. We see here, we see here that familiarity is complacency. Jesus shook this man down. You know what I pray God does to you today? I pray he shakes you down. I pray that you fool around here with him long enough. I pray that you converse and deal with him long enough that he pokes around on you and finds that one thing about you that you say, no, Lord, but you know it's the one thing that he is saying, I want that right there if you are going to participate in the kingdom at all. For some of you, it's money. For some of you, it's beliefs. For some of you, it's thoughts. For some of you, it's relationships. But God wants to shake you down and see if you are willing to participate in the kingdom I pray that you jump up out of your complacency today can somebody say amen why why pastor Dustin why are you preaching so hard to us man we just got back we wearing masks what's up pastor D why do you want us to break out of complacency so bad can I help you because I want a move of God to happen in this earth. I want to see a move of God happen in this city. I want to see a move of God happen in this nation. And I know that no move is coming if his people are walking in an attitude of complacency. I want to see the kingdom of God unleashed in this hour. And it's going to take us shaking up out of our complacency. Can somebody say amen? amen? Ask someone again, will God move? Look at your neighbor and ask them, will you move? Ask someone again, will God move? Ask them, will you move? Ask somebody else, will God move? Ask them, will you move? Why? Because heaven's agenda responds to earth's activity. Mm, mm, mm. Because it's prophetic season and anything can happen right now. Oh, my God. Let me say that again. Why? Because heaven's agenda responds to her earth's activity. Why? Because it is a prophetic season and anything can happen right now. There is no telling what God will respond and how he will respond if you just make a move. Can someone say amen? So God is waiting for just enough people to become uncomplacent, if I can make that a word. When we get to our text, are y'all receiving any, anything today? Are you happy you came to church today? I hope so. When you look at our text, in 2 Kings chapter number 7, Elisha replied, in 2 Kings chapter number 7 and verse number 1, listen to this message from the Lord. Oh my goodness. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one pence of silver. Why was this a shocker? Because they were in famine. They were in drought. They were eating their own babies. They were eating their own posterity. There's so much prophetic happening in this passage of scripture. 
Oh, they were eating away their future. Things were bad, y'all. And the prophet showed up. And the prophet said, by this time, tomorrow, this thing is going to flip on its head. Can I, can I pause here? Look, my microphone has done. Has it been hanging down here the whole time? No, it just fell right now. Okay. Can I prophesy to this nation? Can I prophesy to this church? Things are about to turn. Can I prophesy it? Things are about to turn. Can I say it? Things that you thought could never happen. Breakthroughs that you thought could never happen during this hour. Things are about to turn. The officer assisting the king said something that some of you are thinking right now. The officer assisting the king said this couldn't happen even if the Lord opened up the windows of heaven. There are people watching online. There are people in this building saying this is just a cute message. Oh, but it's so much more than a cute message. Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your very own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. For those of you that think these are cute messages that prophets are preaching right now, you're going to see it happen, but you're going to miss the move. You're going to see it happen, but you're not going get, to get to partake. You won't be able to eat any of it. Why was the prophet so confident that a move of God was about to happen? Why? It's the same reason I'm so confident here today. Because he was aware that heaven's agenda responds to earth's activity. And Elijah was aware that somewhere, can I hold this like this? Elijah was aware that somewhere, I'm good, John, thank you. Elijah was aware, Elisha was aware that somewhere out there, somebody was desperate. Elisha was aware that somewhere out there, somebody is about to do something that no one has ever done before. And Elisha knew that heaven, all heaven needs is a little bit of conduit. All heaven needs is one little window. All heaven needs is just a couple people that will say, God, will you search me to the furthest extreme? All God needs is a handful of people that will pay attention to the hour that they live in. Can someone say amen? So there are four lepers sitting here on the gate. And what do they say? Why are we going to sit here until we die? We've got to move forward. We've got to break out of complacency. Now, we think it's easy for the lepers to realize that they can't stay in a place of complacency. It's easy for this to happen because they're lepers. Oh, but I want to challenge you on this. So many of us are like those four lepers in case, see, I'm done and we can close up. So many of us, even in this building, certainly online, are like those four lepers. Why? Because we're stuck. We're stuck on a wall just like they are stuck. They were stuck on a wall. How are we stuck, Pastor Dustin? Because you're familiar. Familiarity will cause you to get stuck. Familiarity will pause your progress. So some of you might not look at yourself and say, I have leprosy. But if you'll be honest enough with yourself, you'll say, I can see how I've become complacent. If you'll be honest enough with yourself, you'll say, you know what? I'll see that I haven't really challenged myself to think a different way, to grow a different way. As a matter of fact, Pastor Dustin, it's been a minute since I've done something like push back the plate turned some food away, fasted for a few days. It's been a minute since I said, God, deal with me. For some of us, it's been a minute because things have been so good. And that's where the Apostle Paul talked to us in the book of 1 Corinthians. And he said, it's those of us, it's for those of us that things have been so good. It's us that needs to be paying attention the most. It is those of us that need to be the most aware. It is those of us that need to be the least complacent will God move my question to you today is will you move will God move how bad do you want it will God move are you going to go pray more than you're going to go talk all the crap about what's going on in America will God move are you going to go seek God's face more than you're going to go watch CNN or Fox News or fill your head and your spirit with all this junk will God move are you going to seek the Lord more than you're going to talk trash to your homeboys and your homegirls about all the problems going on around you will God move will you press 
Will you press and ask God, do I really have it all figured out or is there something in me that you need to shift? Is there something in me that you need to challenge? Is there something in me that you need to grow? Is there something in me that you need to change? When you begin to move and forcefully advance, when you begin to forcefully take hold of the kingdom of God, I promise you that God is about to do something in this nation, in this world, like we've never seen before. Can somebody give God praise? Place for life. I love you. Let me pray for you. I'm going to close out. I'm going to let Minister John come up here and receive the offering for the end of the service. But if this word was for you, whether you're online or if you're in this building, then I want you to stand and lift both hands towards heaven. And let me pray for you, Father. I thank you for your spirit being in this place. Father, we thank you for this word that you've spoken to us today. Father, we receive the word that you've spoken to us. Father, put us on assignment. Father, if any of us in here are complacent, if any of us in here are stalling the progress that you have planned for our life, Father, help us to get unstuck today. Father, help us to have a hunger today that says, I don't want to sit here in this place any longer. I don't want to think like this anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to feel this anymore. God, but I'm ready to press into it. I don't know where that day might lead me. As a matter of fact, it might not lead to anything. But this one thing I know, I can't turn around and go backwards. I can't sit here anymore. I can't be complacent. But God, help me to press forward. Help me to dig deeper. Help me to be extreme in my walk with you. And God, as I do this, and as we do this as a family, Lord, I pray that you respond from heaven like this nation has never seen, like this generation has never seen. We ask you to move in a way like we have only imagined in the name of Jesus. I prophesy it. It's coming, and it's coming sooner than people think in the name of Jesus. I love you, Place for Life.